Hello, YouTubers. This is another session where uh, my dear friend Joshua and I, you know, continue to talk about building a decentralized social media platform called Taraful. Taraful means people getting to know each other. You know, we kind of took a little bit of break. You know, a lot of things has happened in between our last session and this session. You know, I think our last session, Joshua was like what, like a month ago or something like that. Yeah, more. every 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 intro you say that we take a break. Well, sometime we'll take a break from taking breaks. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> so literally a month ago, like literally today, like a month ago, like so we kind of skipped kind of four sessions, you know. And you know, you know, of course, my sincere apology to the people that are that want to learn about Blazor and want to learn about you know the evolution of this platform. Uh, something really important that I just want to remind people with, you know, there is one thing where you are just writing code right and then you're writing code but you're excited about the the code that you're writing so someone you'll see a lot of people in our industry you know that basically work with technologies you know that they're not really super excited about maybe php or scala or haskell you know there are people that are passionate about these technologies but there are, there are people that are just doing these technologies because it pays you know so these are the people that i call in survival mode right what i advise people is that don't stick there you need to go up a level and work with something that you're excited about, whether it's web applications, gaming, you know, uh, uh, a particular technology like C-sharp.net or whatever, you, whatever you're excited about, right? So that's the second level, right? So you go a little bit above survival, right? And then the last level is when you take all these technologies and go actually solve a problem in our world today right so you'll see a lot of people kind of stick in between these two levels like almost 99.9 percent .9%, you'll see engineers stuck between those two levels what do you think about that josh what do you think about that idea yeah it makes sense that i think when you i know for myself if i find a technology that i like working with and i i want to solve both the, the problem that i don't know how to do in that technology but also the thing that i'm working on and it makes me it, it helps both sides of it a lot better because a lot of times if you just get stuck in that complacent gear um at the time sometimes you that ticket it comes down the the pipeline you're just like ah, another thing that i have to do but uh if you're excited about the technology you're working in uh, it just makes you a better more productive engineer plus then it also like you you it challenges you to become better and better yeah absolutely absolutely and you know taraf is really that you know it's just the problem that we have today with how social media platforms are built today you know i don't know if you watched the recent uh you know mark zuckerberg interview with 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 rogan you know it, it was quite an interesting in interchange and you know for for people who haven't seen it it's actually like some of it is available on youtube it's definitely something that i really highly recommend people kind of go out go out there and watch uh you know kind of try to be unbiased don't listen to anyone telling you not to listen to anyone you know especially someone you know i've lived my whole life hearing people saying listen to someone listen to these people but don't listen to these people this is all bs you know listen to everyone you know make your own judgment you know this is really important and i saw this interview and there are some interesting outtakes on that interview like you know there's there's a lot of things about oh i don't know you know, oh, there is AI, but we're not really, you know, it's not like how people describe it. And then blaming, you know, other organizations or other uh, uh, offices and investigation units about what's actually Facebook is doing. It was quite an interesting interaction. And I thought to myself, Josh, like, while I'm looking at that, I thought to myself, imagine if it's decentralized, you know, it's just code that's sitting there in the, <laughs> in the, in the open source space, right? And you are responsible for what's going on on that particular you know uh, uh uh platform right so it's not owned by anyone it's not controlled by anyone nobody has to answer to anyone everyone is basically is responsible for their own actions you know just because you have the freedom to do something it doesn't mean that you are free from the consequences right if you do something illegal you're going to get punished right there's nothing wrong with that you know because that's how a society operates uh, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at this. Have you taken any chances? Like, you know, there's, there's some funny comment in that, that that was hilarious. The guy was like, you know, I knew <laughs> big into aliens, but props. To, no, not this one. Uh, oh, wow. There's There has been a lot of comments since then. How yeah, 
the comments are great and stuff, but the, and there's a lot of interesting parts of the of the interview going back and forth and stuff. But one of my my favorites, and, and it kind of pertains to this, is that you know Joe Rogan was starting to lean into him and say, well, how do we do this? Or how? Do we, what if we censor too much information? What if we not censor enough? You know, he was kind of going back and forth, and Mark Zuckerberg kind of avoided a lot of the the, the questions or he tried to you know answer them and stuff. But at one point, Joe Rogan says, you know, like, well, what could we do better and everything? And and uh, Mark Zuckerberg says, I don't know. How would you solve that problem? <laughs> and, and Joe Rogan's like. I don't know. It's <laughs> just like him completely <laughs> taken back. Um, but that's kind of the interesting thing is, is Joe Rogan, you know, talks about himself as, as not being the smart guy and that's you know, not his you know, area. He's just asking questions. Um, but we're, we get to ask these questions and as engineers, we got to actually think about it. How would we solve these? And, and what would our response be to, to Mark Zuckerberg? If, if Mark Zuckerberg l- looked at us and said, how, how do you solve this problem? How do you make it better? Well, how do we make it better? Like, let, let's, let's put some thought into it. Maybe maybe we can, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, if you're listening, this is the answer. I don't know. It's it's actually, it's actually you know, you know, his question would be like, how do we make it better while I still make billions of dollars? Yeah. There's yeah. a little condition there. Because you can make it better, but you won't be making millions of dollars anymore. The people that control these communities, the people that actually run and govern these communities are the people that actually will be able to uh, uh, develop and, and, and kind of, enrich these communities imagine if everybody out there is a developer of that social media system right because it's open source right so people starting to fork their own branches and building their own kind of features and stuff some of it gets centralized into the main copy you know so that other people can take a copy of it and some people can go and say nope it's on my own branch you know i'm gonna take my own fork and i'm gonna build my own features right i think i think that's a more I think that's a system that simulates better how our social interactions happen today. You want to go to the bikers club, you want to go to the, you know, physics club, you want to go to the, you know, computer scientists club. Every club has their own admins and they're governing, but there isn't an overarching umbrella, right, that's controlling 2 billion, 3 billion users worldwide. That's just too much power. That's really toxic, you know. Well, in a way, there's actually there is a way that you could actually merge the two, the decentralized part, and he gets to make his billion. So if you're listening, um, so here's my pitch, um, <laughs> because we t- we've talked about this, and in, in the interview, he actually said a couple interesting points where he talked about decentralizing things, and he said we have separation of, of powers for the, for our government. And he's trying to make this elegant, you know, um, uh, response about how it's not his fault, you know, basically, and, and, and uh, he's basically saying we have a group of people that does the content management and the and the regulations and the governance and everything. And and because that's separate that from the leadership and everything, it's mm-hmm. supposed to be unbiased so that they can do their own thing. The leadership can do their own thing. And, and it kind of has its checks and balances. But it also conveniently like insulates him from having to, if they screw up, it's not his 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 fault and everything. And so, so here is a way we could, you would actually merge them together. If we have a de- decentralized uh, you know, social media, mm-hmm. already it's going to remove the responsibility from him or, or Facebook or any uh, one particular governing body because then you're, you're your smaller groups are responsible for that content, mm-hmm. but they make their advertising money and everything and stuff. So if they offered to host the decentralized um, uh, communities mm-hmm. for free, basically in containerized environments, like you self police things, but we get your data in, in response, they could mine and still get the advertising dollars, but have self governing things and stuff. It would be losing a little bit of control, but yet also being able to still, you know, have that, that uh, data mining and stuff. And, but then it would be up to the, the community to decide well i either that's worth it to us to be able to host it for free and allow us to ha- govern ourselves or no that's exactly the thing that we want to preserve is not is to have the decentralized uh, social media so we don't get the data to them um so then they would have to pay for it and host it out, out themselves but the cool thing would be is that the if the two models could talk to each other so i'm going to host my own group here and then the group hosted by zuckerberg we get to talk and share you know choose what we share the data with that could be a cool hybrid Bread, uh, approach too and stuff but anyway yep. just yep. random thought absolutely absolutely thank you thank you for that you know anyway back to that point you know what i'm trying to kind of bring people attention to you know especially engineers don't just don't just write code for money get grow up a little bit out of that stage don't just write code that you like even though you're going towards a purpose you don't like you know combine all of these right work with something that pays you well work for something that you enjoy and work towards something that you care about. What do you think about that deal? Is that a good equation, Joshua? I think that's a great equation, right? I think 
software engineers can truly reach the level of fulfillment and happiness when they actually achieve these three goals. What do you think about that, Josh? Do you think that's a good deal? Yeah, I think everybody should strive to that. And I think uh, the more you can the strive to it, the more you can kind of uh, uh, manifest is the wrong word, but like you can achieve those things. And I, th- I think it is, it gets you into opportunities you never th- thought would be uh, possible. Because if you look for, uh, you know, those items on a, on a uh, job request or, or, a, or, you know, requirements or whatever and stuff, you probably won't find them. But the more you do it, and all of a sudden you find yourself in, a, in an environment that you're like, I like what I do. I like what I'm being challenged. And I get to do, solve problems that I never thought I would be able to solve. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what, are we, what problem are we solving today? So, so first of all, I want to take this as an opportunity to kind of, you know, explain to people why. Here's here's a question to you, Josh. You know, when we built Tarafu, you know, and we built this amazing UI components, we talked a little bit. You know, we kind of chose to go the server side route, and we're probably going to stay there for a while. But I want people to understand, you know, the difference between. Blazor server side, uh, Blazor client side, Wasm, and Blazor hybrid, right? And why, why there is kind of you know a a lot of people have asked this question, right? How do I know the difference between Blazor server side, client side, and hybrid, right? Why don't you share first, you know, your two cents on the topic, and then I'll share a couple of things, and we'll see if we can actually make a beneficial content for people today. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I love this topic. This is the, one of the areas that when Hassan kind of first uh, introduced this, I uh, really got me into Blazor because I was like, okay, how does this work? Because traditionally, a server side um, page would, you know, a server side is is basically anytime that you want something to change, you have to click something, do something on the page, and the whole page refreshes and stuff. That's a good indicator that it's making a round trip to the server, coming back and, and presenting that to, uh, to you. It doesn't mean that you can't have animations and can't have some cool uh, whiz bang things on the on the page, but it's not going to be as that rich experience as your client side application. So that's if that's server side and everything has to go to the server, that's where it lives. Every interaction is, is with the server. The opposite of that is client side. Once you have the assets downloaded on your machine, you can basically do a lot and it's only going to f- phone home when it needs to persist data or it needs to get more uh, more code to, to run on your on your machine. So, that so, basically. So, so. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Josh. I'm just drawing what your picture. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. That, that's basically been the story of, of JavaScript and front-end uh, development. Now come along either hybrid or server-side rendered. Um, so if you take your client-side technologies and say we want to you know, uh, pre-bake or get your JavaScript pages uh, started on the server side to be eaten. Uh, this usually happens when you have like low powered machines or or mobile devices or whatnot. We want to get most of it started so that it you don't have a, a bunch of uh, spinners or whatnot. We want to pre bake or or preset those pages for you, but we also want to use those front end technologies. We're going to start them off on the server, and then the client side you know, code will take over. So mm-hmm. with, uh, it can be done with React and whatnot and stuff, but usually it's a it's the next level up. Um, people will start with server side pages, then they'll say, no, we want more functionality. Well, they'll go client side. Then like, well, now there's a trade-off. Now we want to push some of that logic to the to the server side. There's this back and forth, and you have to have people that know what's going on. It can get pretty technical pretty quick. Like The cool thing about Blazor is when you do file new and say Blazor project, and you just check the box for server side or client side, yep. it's kind of hard to tell what, what the difference is. And the yep. cool part of it is because you write the application the exact same way. Yep. With the client side JavaScript and the server side JavaScript, it's completely different. You have to wrap your head around a completely different methodology. All your code is completely different. You have to have people with experience around those things. But with Blazor, the client side and server side, you write the code the exact same way. And during compile time, it knows to split things down to whether it's going to be rendered on, you know, have the the, the your uh, main part of your application be downloaded as a static file that runs in on the Wasm Wasm uh, area of your of your browser, or if it's going to phone home and make that call to the server. Yep. So yep. the big difference is when your page loads the first time and it's a server side Blazor application. Mm-hmm. You're going to phone home. Just the, the you're going to say, "Here's the the action that I have." So just like a React application would and stuff, you're going to phone home. I clicked a button. That a- application is going to compute what is going to be different on the server. Send mm-hmm. back only the information that is going to be different. Say that the counter goes up by one, and your your button changes to blue instead of red. Yep. It'll send back only that information, and the then the thing basically, up. yeah. Yep. And it's communicated only over WebSockets, and only that diff gets updated on the on the UI. 
Okay, so you send the render request, it sends you a render response. So it's cooking the page on the server, the actual HTML. Okay, which basically is a huge kind of undertaking to the server because if you have many, 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 many clients, right? That means your server is literally getting hammered, you know? And, and, and we have seen some of these, right? And some of the applications that you and I built, you know, you reach a certain, you know, number of users, you start experiencing issues because there's the signal R, you know, kind of communication going on between the server and the page. And that's how Blazor knows, you know, oh, I need to update this page and all that. It needs somehow to have the client tell the server, hey, there's an open communication and the server sends back response. So, okay, I, I'm not gonna talk about performance yet, but I will go to this to this piece here. You know, I'm gonna go and say, okay, on the on the Blazor, you know, client side, Joshua, you know, there's a different equation here, right? Because you're basically going and saying, wait a second, I don't want my server to do all that work. Right, I want to be able to go and say, so this is a server, this is client side, client, client side, right? Um, in the client side, you're not actually sending a render request, right? You're basically sending a data request because you don't have to kind of load, you know, the UI, the, the entire UI is already loaded at, at first glance. Like the server will serve the entire app, right? A spa app or whatever the case may be. And now the only responsibility here between the server and the client is, hey, call the API and give me data. I don't want anything other than, and maybe that's why it's easier to host it on, on GitHub uh, pages and stuff like that, because there is no server. It's literally, it's technically HTML and JavaScript underneath. There's nothing else going on. And you need just a server to kind of serve all these files to render it on the screen. So let me ask you a question then. And I need to call this client, by the way. So this is a client. Okay. So, okay. Of course, OCD is going to kick in and I'm not going to be happy with it. So I'm going to go down here and just call it client in here. So this is client like this. Okay. So let me ask you a question, Joshua. Now, you know, in terms, let's start in, in terms of basic majority of application that one would work with, right? Would you go server side Blazor or like like you and I are developing a social media platform, right? You know, this can be quite quite a busy, busy application. Like, you know, there's a lot of interactions going on here and a lot of things going on. What would be your your first choice? Would you go client side, server side? What would you go with? Well, yeah. So to to go there, let's let me phrase the one trade off. I don't know if we covered fully and stuff. So on on the server side, you download a little bit of code onto your browser, maybe some HTML, some um, uh, some CSS, a little bit of your your uh, WASM that's going to call the the server. It's going to phone home. That it's going to communicate over WebSockets, and then it's going to return back the bits of code or the, the the what needs to be changed on the on the page. Everybody knows that, that on the server side. On the client side, the downside, the trade off is all those bits of of logic that know how to like change the button to blue and increment the counter, that has to live somewhere. And if we're going to be on the client side, that means it has to take all the existing files that need, there are assets you need on your, on your client, plus the bits of the logic that are going to do the server side rendering and move that to the client. So what that means is your client becomes bigger and more bloated and, and, and bulkier. Mm -hmm. So that's the trade-off is, is do we want a lot of data going back and forth or do we want a lot of code of like that, of that, that first initial uh, download? Um, and that's what I think a lot of front end developers are used to is do we want that, like all of our, you know, script tags and, and our libraries be downloaded all at once, or do we want that, you know, do we want that initial hit or do we, want to have it lazy loaded and have some spinners or whatever and so that's kind of the the, the trade-offs and stuff so which, uh -huh. what do we pick for what scenario well i think the the there's you know that's the one question we have to ask is do we want that initial hit or do we want the lazy loading but we also have to ask what's our target audience if our target audience is on low powered devices but yet we have a fast internet connection well let's do obviously do the the server side where would client side be uh applicable well, when you're being extremely cheap and want to host it, you know, on CDN or static sites, or you just uh, want to have it uh, downloaded and then not connect to a server. So maybe maybe you, you're you going to hit any server possible and your, your servers can scale or whatnot. We just want to do everything. We're playing a game or whatever. We just need to store the session at some point when you click save. It'll just, you know, pin and phone home to any server possible. That could be another uh, useful area for uh, client side and everything. Um, but where to start off from most scenarios? 
your fastest, lightest experience is going to come from the server side experience. Um, mm-hmm. From what I've seen, because it requires the least amount of resources on your client mm-hmm. to be able to operate. So I yep. would always default with the server side and then only go to the client side when you have a specific scenario, like we're trying to save money or we're trying to scale in a weird way, or we just want to have no internet connectivity. It, just to clarify things for people, you know, watching, you know, the, what Josh is basically talking about is that in, in a, a really busy scenario where you have many, many, many clients, you don't want that cooking, that rendering that happens, you know, on the server side to actually happen there. Because once you start hitting like a million, a million client, you're going to see how the, you know, start to the degradation starts to happen to your server because each and every one of them is hitting your server and they are requiring high processing power, you know, to kind of get your server to kind of serve um uh, uh the 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 pre-rendered right the pre-rendered kind of content right so that's client one client two and client ten right there's also another part you know if, in terms of flexibility it becomes quite challenging and i'll tell you guys now in a second now you're tied up like these these clients and servers are tied up to each other what does that mean you can't break this into smaller pieces with certain areas in your server concern, like you can't actually go and say, okay, I, I'm going to take my server here and I'm going to break it into three other microservices and each one of them will be responsible for rendering a certain portion of a page. Like you can't have a microservice only rendering buttons and another microservice only rendering text boxes. So now you're kind of getting into this monolithic situation where the server has to render everything, right? The opposite of that is that if you let the client render, like the client has its own kind of app and your server is only serving data, oh, now you can totally scale because now you're just serving data. That data can come from anywhere, right? You could serve students from one microservice. You know, it's not actually a bad idea, Josh. Maybe someone should think about that, like serving different pieces of the page from different services. I should probably ask Daniel Roth about that. That that might be interesting. It would be crazy challenging, though, because how would you even... Like, how do you begin that? And who's the aggregator of these services and all that? Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say, if you if you watch any of uh, Steve Sanderson's um, demos here lately and stuff, he talks about um, with the whether it be the dynamic components or the or the client side rendering and everything. There are some things that you could be have a server side um, instance going back and forth to have a persistent connection. But if it's being too chatty, one way to lower the communication, maybe you do go ahead and part of the page is loading a a static uh, resource or or the client side. So maybe you have a, a, a hosted uh, a blended uh, version of the two. Uh, but the, but again, this is a very contrived or, or complicated scenario. So if you if you're going to start with one, it's easier to start with the server side deal. But there might be uh, reasons to have either a hybrid or the the client approach. Um, but yeah, it'd be very interesting to uh, to come. And, and uh, this is a little bit further down the road. But if you've seen some of the the updates from the uh, .NET team, um, the ability to uh, run some of the uh, the the .NET Core uh, stuff in in containers, they're they're looking at ways to and instead of having one service, you can actually isolate it through um, pass. So like your one endpoint is going to uh, spawn off a, uh, a process or a service and everything and, and start to be able to operate more on containers. So what does that look like with a web, with persistent web connection? I think these are all we need answers. We need to we need to follow up on this. There, there, there's also like I think I think Sanderson is also exploring the option of having the client run a server in the browser. And I'm trying to kind of. So, so let me show you, let me show you what he, what he basically is going for. Like he's, he's, he's deep into this now. This is the point of no return, you know, like he's in there. Like, uh, so I, so I heard this, but it did break my brain a bit, a bit. So maybe you can unpack that and stuff. So like there's certain scenarios where you want run a server in the, in the browser, but then there's certain things I'm just asking, like, why are we going the wrong direction? So unpack it for me. Why is that useful? He, 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 I, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you high level and then I'll tell you, you know, a little bit more in detail. He calls it Wazi, I think, right? He calls it Mm -hmm. Wazi. And his idea is, you know, if we are allowing the client to do everything, right? Like you're handing over. This is like, it's, it's a, it's a, what do you call it, Josh? Like a a pendulum, pendulum, Mm -hmm. is that what it is? That goes back and forth like this. So it's basically, okay, there's a server and the client. And he was like, why would I bother? Why don't I make the server 
the client and let the entire process, the app, the back end, front end, everything just runs on the client side, right? So now you have no server store because you still have to pay for APIs, you know, and you still have to pay for something sitting on the back end to serve all that data, right? So now he's saying, what if we just minimize it into the data source? So it's mm -hmm. only the data source that like, <laughs> let, me, let, let me show you. So so he's it, it all started, it was the June of 1918. <laughs> you know, it was a cold winter when, uh, you know, okay, so so let me just show you. So going back to this design here, here's here's how this palindrome, palindrome, what is it? <laughs> I, I keep forgetting. But how do you pendulum. say it? Pendulum. Pendulum. Yes. Yeah. Pendulum. yes. So let's go back here. So it started like this. One crazy idea of people going and saying, oh, let's have a server. Let's have a server and let's have a client. And these two live completely far away from each other. So the server is in the cloud. The client is on the client side, right? And maybe there is a resource sitting up in here, you know, some data source that's sitting up here that's doing whatever you need, right? And then new scenarios started to emerge, right? We, people kept going back and forth. Oh, do we put the rendering data here and serve here? Or this is an independent CDN project that you're just serving and it it's talking to the server using the using the token from the customer and then sending it to the server and the server is deciding. Okay, great. And now Steve Sanderson is thinking, oh, let me merge that in. So now you have Wazi where you're basically going and saying, oh, I want the server and the client to both live on the client side. Okay, so now you have, it's like you have microservices running in the browser so it, it i was thinking this would be really cool for uh containerized things but yeah you're, you're, you're moving the container i remember this this presentation now so now you're actually moving the container into the into the browser so the only concern is how much load does that put on the actual on the browser and how you know how, how performant does that run but then basically every browser becomes a container and because you basically you've all you dependency injected your connection strings now connect to your your data source directly and it should have all your logic and permissions already baked and compiled into the into the server there um it'd be interesting to see how obfuscated that is and how you know because one of the reasons we always keep our api separate is because of our business that's where our business logic lives so it's all of our business logic then going to be moved into this containerized thing into the in the browser and then you basically have to have version instead of versioned apis you have to have a version container and so you'd have to know when to cache bust your your server and but it would be the whole server this is this breaks my brain <laughs> <laughs> and 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 just for the people kind of wondering about the next generation like the evolution of blazer right he you know this is this is sanderson's um dot uh, net wazi sdk right and he talks here about an experimental he always starts like this he started blazer like this he basically went and said oh it's just experimental what if we can run c sharp in the browser and then you know world broke loose right everyone started talking about it and all that he's basically saying this sdk is experimental project package that can build dotnet core projects including a whole asp net core application into a standalone wasi compliant wasm files so the asp net core app and everything else in between becomes a wasm file that you can run in your in your browser this guy needs a uh, camera crew to follow him along, yeah. around just so we can keep up with him. I mean, yeah. this is this is when I when I had a podcast with uh, David Fowler. You know, he's like every time I meet him in a conference, every time I meet Steve Sanderson in a conference or something like that, I know that the first ten minutes he's gonna say something that's completely mind blowing. You know, like I was like, "What are you up to these days?" He'd be like, "Oh, I'm trying to run C sharp in the browser." I was like, "I'm sorry, what? What are you doing now?" <laughs> so it's it's actually, you know, I'll tell you something though. Like the, the relationship between these two guys, like you know, David Fowler is behind ASP.NET Core. He has a big, big role into developing ASP. We used to have ASP.NET Framework MVC. Now he came up with ASP.NET Core. I was even joking with him the other day on the podcast. I said, "Oh, okay, so this is where you're from. This is the 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 island that gave us." you know, ASP.NET Core, right? And he was laughing. We had a little bit of fun. Sanderson is sitting on the client side or the UI side of this. So you see how their relationship, like there is a good connection there. Very humble, very nice people. You know, um, it's, it's, it's quite refreshing to see 
the people behind the technologies that we're using and just be able to just go out there and talk to them directly. Okay. Okay. Back to our discussion. I think people are listening to us or watching this podcast. They'll be thinking, oh my God, I'm just trying to figure out WebAssembly <laughs> and Sanderson is already flying into Wazi. There is, there is another actually, um, uh, another, uh, you know, cool kid on the block which is the Blazor hybrid. And let me show you here something very interesting. Like if you look at the documentation of Blazor, watch this. So there's Blazor server, Blazor web assembly, and then Blazor hybrid. And what the heck is that, right? If you look at uh, Blazor hybrid, it's basically talking about Blazor can also be used to build native client apps using a hybrid approach. Hybrid apps are native apps that leverage web technologies for their functionality. Like if you're building a mobile application, you could have things that are running Xamarin local to your app, but you can also render DOM components from the server, right? So it's both like client side and server side at the same time, right? And and, and now Xamarin is now known as Maui, right? Is that, Maui. Is that yeah, that's the yeah. new thing. So now, you, you know, Xamarin is going away slowly but surely. Right, and I think I think they announced kind of uh, sunsetting Xamarin. I think Xamarin sunset. Well, it'll never go away. It'll just uh... yeah, there it is. Xamarin toolkit goes away. I think that was that was recent, July twenty second. Yeah, Xamarin Zam, Xamarin sunset, uh, and I, I think it started. I kind of noticed when they started kind of saying, okay, Xamarin University is going to go away, right? And I know why. Like, if you have a company like Apple, right, that's having this amazing you know uh, uh kind of coherent system that's running on the mobile running as a desktop application and all that but apple is not really interested in going and building web technologies and stuff like that but we like we use whatever you want you know we don't care right it, it, what we're trying to do here is to kind of create the tooling and the technology that would actually allow this kind of hybrid approach uh, someone did some really good work in here and they basically put together uh, the comparisons, right? So you see how server is still really strong, you know, in certain areas, but not as strong in, in other areas, right? Like if you look at, you know, static site hosting, run apps offline once they're downloaded, of course, I think the server is not going to be able to give you that, you know, offloads processing to clients, full access to native client capabilities. You don't have that kind of power with the server side because the server doesn't know what, what client it's running on. So obviously they don't know what, what to do there, right? Full access to native client capabilities actually is exclusive to hybrid because that's like desktop and mobile applications, right? This this uh, this screen might be really, really small. I don't know how to kind of, yeah, there you go, no, right? It looks good, yeah. And then of course you have the web-based development. Compile.net API compatibility. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. You can see the differences in here between kind of, I don't know what these signs mean, Joshua. Do, do, do you know what these little... Yeah, you can see it right below the text. There's a there's a like a plus button, and then there's like a double plus. So it's like an asterisk of of saying you know you need to read the 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 fine details below. <laughs> okay, maybe at the bottom so, they, they'll tell so, us. No, 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 no. Scroll up. So so right below that little graph, right? So right. Oh, there, right? oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's very subtle. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Well, you noticed it. You know, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so 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 let me ask you this. I think a better strategy is to start with server side. If you're starting from scratch, something that you don't know how much it's going to scale yet, you're starting server side, everything is simple and easy. And then you migrate into a client side or hybrid as your audience grows. What do you think about that idea? Well, I was just to say, if you pull that chart back up and stuff, uh, I mean, the, there's that graphic and then there's the chart. So it might be if you're if you're just starting out and you have very specific requirements, you need you might need to consult this this graph. Like, you know, if you're if you say that you have to run things offline, well, then you can only do the the WASM or the the hybrid approach. But it, so if you consult this this uh, this chart, then it kind of gives you an indicator there. But I think the really the 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 story about hybrid isn't it showing us the the theme that no matter like you just said is 
no matter what area you start, if you can run the Maui application on a mobile phone and it uses the same components as a web component, you no matter what approach you start with, you make your components, and then those coded components can then just be migrated or used as a library or or moved over to a different project. And then really, like we have to understand how a little bit of how these apps work, and everything. But for the most part, a lot of this is obfuscated from the developer, and we just develop our components, and then they can be plugged into any format of the of where wherever blazer is going to run is that right yes absolutely and i think i think that's i, I agree with you 100 percent. i think that's it you know and i think also like if you're developing anything out there you're more likely to need a hybrid blazer kind of uh, mobile application you know if you're doing anything it doesn't matter what it is it's a mobile first cloud first world today you know there are websites that's great but how often the vast majority of computation consumers are more on the on the phone than being on a desktop like you and i are software engineers right so at least i know you are you know so <laughs> so so uh, you know the we we need these big capabilities but for the regular person out there on the street that doesn't need to stream doesn't need to develop anything they have their phone they can send the emails from their phones they can watch YouTube from their phones. They don't have to worry about none of these complicated, you know, kind of setups to kind of do something like that. I guess, except for gamers, right? Gamers would need to kind of beef up their machines. Although that I have to say, like mobile games are now going, you know, exponentially out of, out of, you know, the, the, the gaming industry is bigger than the NFL, NBA, and, and a bunch of other industries all combined together. It's crazy, like $9 billion industry, it's crazy. So, okay. So server side, client side, you know, you go server side, you know, until your your phone bill start going really, really high or your Azure bill start going really, really high and then switch over. Is the switch easy? Is it simple? Of course it is. Like, you know, it, you know, I think you're just changing certain configurations, right, Josh? Like to actually change a certain configuration from being rendered on the server than being rendered on the client. I think another challenge is to kind of, and we need to kind of talk to people about this, you know, what is... Like, you know, what is CDN and why is it important? Why don't you give people a little bit of insight about that? Sure. So a CDN is a content delivery network. So uh, if I got my acronym uh, right and stuff. Um, so basically we want to uh, deploy things. So if we're, you know, if we're, uh, if, if Hassan's on the West coast and I'm in central U S and then we serve our pages up and everything, there might be a server that uh, be able to, uh, to serve pages slightly faster if I'm in the Midwest um, instead of having to go all, all the way out to the West Coast. But what if we have to, like, someone's going to load our, our website or our app that's in Europe or in Asia or whatnot and stuff. Um, CDN allows you to have uh, duplicates or, or uh, mirrors of things across the uh, different regions of the, of the world so that wherever you are in the world, you get a faster response. So if you have a static asset, um, instead of, you know, someone who's trying to look at your page in Europe, didn't have to go all the way across the, the across Across the pond um, to be able to load your your site, they can just hit the the mirror or the or the copy that's closest to them. That's your content delivery network. You you set up a, a, a redundant system to be able to deliver the content in the fastest way possible to to that's closer to your user. And it might be physically the, the fastest or just the fastest connection. Um, but that's the, by deploying your assets to to a CDN, you're going to be able to reach people faster instead of having to have loaders and, and spinners it, and, and it's geo redundant like you know you could it's basically cache for the web right like yep. geo redundant caching everywhere around the world where you don't have to worry about you know you know the craziness with wazi is that it can also be hosted now in a cdn so you're shipping not just the client but you're also shipping the entire server yeah like you're giving your customer the entire app what do you think about the security issues with that well, that, that's a, the, the interesting thing that we'd have to look at and stuff like what is uh, I mean, we already s store our secrets encrypted in, in like key vault. So like, say, if your first um, call, maybe you get your application from your CDN, but you get the, the critical bits or the, the updated information sure. from like, you know, like, hey, what which version of the database do I go to? Or where do I, you know, uh, you you have concepts of like eventual consistency. So if, if it's not important to have the actual like real time data, then you can get a cache 
cash version that's you know closer to you in, in Europe or whatnot, how do you get the connection strings for those things? Well, if you if your app is hosted on a CDN, but then you get the connection string from wherever in the world, you get one call to you know the far off land to get that connection string. It comes down encrypted, and then you use it for the life. Of, it'd just be like your token or your or your certificates or or anything that else that we store in our local browser. It has validation. You can be revoked. All those different things. So uh, it'd be interesting to see the mechanisms of there and stuff. But the phone home to get that information. Come back, use that while you have an active session. All your app and your and your logic is here. Um, there would be a concern of like, you know, do we store how, what business logic can we put on the client? How do, how is that compiled down? But if we are compiling it down, I mean, I'm not going to try and read that. And you know, <laughs> if it's even readable Nobody, and stuff. But yeah, nobody's going to try that. <laughs> how, how how much is it readable and and uh and what what is uh actually in the browser by the time that you you run it do you do you know that right right and also it, it, you know you, there is no guarantee of the performance of the app because the client is changing like if someone has a really crappy machine you know thanks to chrome is already consuming memory right and left you know it's not leaving anything for anyone i don't know what it's doing i honestly don't know what chrome is doing behind the scenes that needs all this memory you know well, if, i know if chrome, if chrome already has your memory you might as well use it right you know so. <laughs> that's right i don't know if it's reserved or actually in consumption or virtual i don't know what it's doing but you know i know that someone at some point in time thought oh the problem with all the browsers is that they're all running as one instance and some genius at google went and said oh let's just spin them all up as independent processes with their own reserved memory mm -hmm. so now every tab every tab in your browser is its own individual isolated app that's running with its own process and its own thread and its own memory it's it's ridiculous it's hilarious actually right and then there's this root that basically keeps track of all of them. So it opens all of them back up, you know, when you need, you know, to kind of when you shut down the PC uh, unexpectedly or something like that. Anyway, okay, so so consumption, right? Consumption, resources, you know, it can be quite, you know, if you care about the performance of your application, you would probably do it on the server, right? Because the server has this massive power that can actually render and crunch down the app for you before it sends it for you to consume it. You know, versus it feels like, you know, these, you know, these potluck restaurants where you go cook your own food. It feels pot like. Lock. Is it but, but, potluck or potlog? Potluck, like you're lucky, potluck. Potluck. I thought yeah. it was, I thought it was potlock, like locking. No, locking it, a door. It, it, it's everybody brings their own pot of food, and if you're lucky, you'll get good food. So it's a no, no, luck. no, no, no. I mean, you know these restaurants where they go give you raw food and you cook it for yourself. No one knows what you're talking about. No, I know, I know what you're talking about. That. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It feels like yeah. it, it feels like you're. It feels like hey, here, hey, client, you do the work. Hmm. You know, you go cook your own meal. You know, so I don't have to do it, right? Versus the server doing everything and then serving, serving that. But again, it could be quite, quite expensive. Very, very expensive. Anyway, let's wrap up this podcast. I think this is great. I think this is great content. Just something to give people. If I were to simplify things for people, just think about this, you know, start server side, migrate to client side as your client base grows and we're talking millions here like a couple of thousand customers is not really going to break your server right a couple of million will have you kind of thinking what am i doing right and i think probably wazi could could help out with the whole signal r communication thing between the server and the client because now you don't have to worry about reaching a maximum number of connections on the server because now the server doesn't have to worry about how many connections it needs to keep you know, with every customer and client. For people watching, and I, this is always the example that I use, imagine you're on Google Docs, you know, or, you know, you're, you're editing a document. Sometimes you might lose the connection. You shouldn't, your app shouldn't disappear when you lose the connection with the server, right? Your app should continue to be able to keep track of all what you're doing until you come back into connection and then go ahead and send that data. And some people will be like, where's that data is being stored, Joshua? You know, I don't think, like, I don't think it's very popular that these uh, browsers have their own kind of storage. They have their own, not this one. Mm -hmm. They have their own, uh, right, right, Joshua? They have their mm -hmm. own storage. They have their own 
if you go into uh, more tools, developer tools, look up in here. Like, you know, look at this, guys. You know, if you look at uh, there's network, there's sources, and then you have a whole bunch of things going on here. I don't think, no, not, this is not where the storage is. Uh, where is it? File system, overrides, content scripts. <laughs> Uh, I just want to see if you, if you can find it, but no, yeah, no, you can start it in your local, your uh, cookies, your cache and everything and stuff. But then there's also, also like a SQL light, like a little uh, yeah, database that you can, you can access to and stuff. Um, where is it? Where is it at? Where do they keep probably it? Probably under your file system, right? It should be under file system, right? Uh, yeah. Network. Unless they moved it. You know, unless they said, oh, it's, it's too much work. We're not going to keep it anymore. Yeah. So click, did you click the file system button? Where, where is where, it? It just moved on you. Yeah. So under click that that more uh, deal. Lighthouse. Then, what what the heck is Lighthouse? Generate Lighthouse. Light. Is actually, yeah, this is actually really cool. It's a, so this is uh, Google's uh, way to tell you whether it's accessible and stuff. So um, we have you know Microsoft has their own uh, tools, everything, but Lighthouse will shine light on areas that you need to improve on your on your site, whether it's a, a, a speed um, report on like how fast your site reloads, whether Google can read it or not, or just be able to see if someone has a uh, accessibility. Nice. Yeah, oh it's actually, my god. I did not. There it is. There it is. An application. Look, you have local storage. It's an uh, application, Josh. You know. See, but it says storage. So why wouldn't storage be in value? Yeah, look, it's yeah, key yeah, value yeah. pair. Like literally, session storage, key value pair. You have your own like key vault yeah. running. Whip SQL, whatever the heck that is. <laughs> you know, tokens, cache storage. Look how many databases, tiny, yep. tiny databases running. You know, in your server from every site. How crazy is that? Is that yep. the local and, storage that you access when you do JavaScript applications? Uh, it can be, yeah. I mean, it, so when when you when JavaScript, you get to choose whether where where you want. You know, again, do you want to start it as, as a as a cookie? Do you want to start it as a session? Do you want to start it as a local? You could write to your actual like desktop if you wanted to. But uh, uh, if you have a lot of relational database uh, um, kind of information, you can put it in that uh, that in memory, or I guess it's not in memory. It'd be the 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 um, persisted uh, database. Um, mobile phones also have this, so you can actually it uh, on Android or iOS and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's it's something you can definitely take advantage of. So anytime you have like something that, if you have a view that's uh, like you know join multiple tables together, run a report, whatnot, and you don't want to constantly hit that that from the server, you can say I'm going to cache this ahead of time, and then I'm getting I can do other reports on my on my uh, information that's stored locally, and then only phone home if I'm doing some other like query that I right. hadn't already included and stuff. So yeah, it's very powerful. That's that's very that's very sweet. I, I also wanted to ask you: Do people save tokens, like like uh, hashes and tokens and security things in storages, or what's the best practice there? Uh, well, I mean, you bet. Yes, people do that. Um, and and uh, yeah, uh, you reach into your storage a lot of time uh, to to mess with your tokens and stuff. I mean, obviously, a best practice would be to use a library that is meant to do that and stuff. So like if you're using an auth library, you really shouldn't have to be working with uh, tokens that much. If you're doing a lot of like getting and setting and re reading and writing and manipulating of tokens, it, it just it, it exposes you to have more. Uh, I think they, the, the term I, I've heard a lot is uh, surface area for bugs. The more code that you write is the more surface area you have for bugs. So find a, a library that you can trust and kind of offload that that security concern and use it and let them phone home, create the the, the uh, update your your certificates, update your tokens, and then and uh, and let it do do it automatically. So the, a lot of the times the HTTP client that we use in our applications will either you basically give the client that your uh, ID that you that you're trying to access. It will go out and get the the certificate and the and the uh, the token that you need, and then we'll do silent refreshes for you. And then every time you make a call, it just sends that that uh, that bearer token with you with the with the call, and you don't have to ever worry about the authentication, which is something I appreciate. I don't want to do it. I just want to call my API and get the data. So it's I their fault if it. <laughs> yeah, I I love love that someone just went and built like a nice library. That allows you to interact with storage like you could literally just say get item async you inject it you inject the storage just like anything else add blazer add blazered local storage and boom you have immediate access in c sharp to your to your storage just like that i mm -hmm. i have not played around with this before it looks like you also have kind of settings all kinds of settings that you want to set up you have all that's beautiful that's that's amazing this is a good library right there you know and uh, i appreciate people like it seems to be uh, nine months, four years, five months ago. It seems like the last time 
he touched. I mean, there isn't much really to do. Just put keys and pull keys. Like, you know, there isn't really. I wonder how much adaptation. Oh, it's, it's Chris Million. It's, uh, is Chris the author of this, or is he just a sponsor of the of the application? Sponsor this project. I think Chris, uh, Chris is the, no, no, is the no, author. No, 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 he he authored it. Who's Chris? Do you know him? Oh yeah, we we everybody knows Chris. He's a Microsoft MVP. We what? Everybody knows Chris. We, he's in the well. We know of Chris. I don't know him personally, but um, I've read his blogs. I've seen I've seen his uh, talks and everything and stuff. So why why do I not know Chris? That's sad. I mean, how how are you not in the know? You need uh, you need to correct this. <laughs> I, I, I need I need to pull this brother into one of our uh, kind of podcasts. Get to know about I his know, journey. Uh-huh. I know when I'm googling stuff, his name comes up quite a bit. So really okay. Yep. Well, that's sweet. I like this. I like his library. It has about 2 million downloads. That's great. Like, look at this. It's a nice adaptation. You know, he's getting about 1,000 every day. That's a sweet, sweet library. It seems like he's actually pushing forward with this. That's really sweet. Anyway, my my hits at batteries are running out. Oh, no. <laughs> so he talks so much that is yeah, that's I, I, why. You know, I have, like, I, I have like two of them, you know, and I get into these situations where it just – kind of dies on me you know who it died on me while it was talking my batteries to my batteries are dying too with this uh you know you need to go old school <laughs> i don't know who was I, I don't know who i was podcasting with i think it, it might have been um uh, daniel roth or someone oh it was um uh uh it, it was uh matt matt sturgerson you know and it died mid-conversation and i had to kind of lift finger up and be like wait 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 and then i threw this and i went running to pull it from the it was it was a disaster but we figured it out you know when when i had when i had my podcast with sanderson you know his computer froze and it just went quiet i was like oh my god what's going on today is is a weird day he's like in the middle of the podcast he was like i can hear you i can't see anything It's because of all that wazzy stuff he's doing. He broke the system. That's, that's not a good advertisement there. That's not, you know, he's he's running wazzy and it broke his system. Great, wonderful. <laughs> anyway, they're they're all sweet people. You have no idea. Like, you know, I asked him a question, I said to him, Hey, you know, I kind of made a you know, kind of you know, cheeky joke at the beginning. You know, so now I say cheeky like Brian Brian Parker from Australia. Now I start I talk like <laughs> him. Uh, I said to him, you know, hey, you know, I'm sorry about the it kind of you know, might be a little bit rough joke with you. We really don't know each other that well. And Steve was like, I thought it was funny. Please don't remove it. Leave it in there. <laughs> I, I loved him immediately. I just loved him immediately. There's so much humbleness in the people that create such great technology. They actually enjoy what they're doing and they love what they're doing. Anyway, Joshua, you know, next session, let's pick pick back up, you know, just for the people watching. If you have been in disconnect, like, you know, there has been some things going on and you're kind of bringing people back together. Don't jump straight into code, like kind of pull people back up slowly and just start, t- start talking about different topic, kind of get people warmed up. And then the next session, you and I will uh, build that dashboard for Tom Ruffle. Sounds good. Sounds great. Yep. Sounds good. And as usual, for people watching us, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, compliments for my dear friend, beloved, beloved friend here and brother, uh, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. If we said anything or missed anything, you know, please feel free to correct us. That would be really help us a lot and help the community. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in another video. Thank you, Joshua.